Welcome to another edition of Pens Down. On this program, we connect with the world of journalism, journalists and bring you all the behind the scenes stories, the things they go through, their journey, particularly, how they got here, what they grapple with in the line of duty, and everything in between that doesn't get reported as part of the news or programs. Today, we are traveling to Liberia. Liberia is one of the English speaking countries in West Africa. And we are touching base with a multimedia journalist there. Uh, my guest is Denise Nipson. The rest of her profile, you have the opportunity to read on your screen while we go ahead with this conversation. Happy to have you on Pens Down and welcome. Thank you so much. Um pleased and happy to be on your program. Right. Uh, was that your original decision to become a journalist or you fell into it by accident? <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I think um, from the beginning. OK. From the yes, from the of my joining, mm. it wasn't. Um, yes, I, I would term it like that, but then um, along the way, I thought it wise, okay, yes, to become a journalist. For so, but from my beginning, as a young person coming out, coming up as a um child, yes, that was in my dream from the beginning. How long have you been here since you missed your way? Into this AK fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> it has been wonderful since I've been um been part of it and um counting eight years now. Great. These so eight years, years now. These eight years, or let's say almost a decade, uh, what will stand out as the most challenging assignment for you? Hmm. Okay, um, the more challenging assignment was when um I was assigned with the president. Okay. When I was assigned, yes, with the president as executive marshal reporter, and I had to, you know, um double up because being assigned with the president or the presidency it takes a lot. Mm -hmm. You as a journalist, you have to be on your alert. You have to move whenever the president is moving. Mm. And all of what comes with the, the presidency in terms of you um, being part of the president motorcade, you have to have that um, that courage to be in that kind of a mood in terms mm. of the urgency of their work that they do you as a journalist as well. You have to conform to that. Mm. So sometimes it was, it was for a those okay, sometimes yeah. for those who report from the presidency, by the end of the day, you have about three, four, five stories. Sometimes very late into the evening, and uh, you have to put all together so that you can clear your desk and then prepare for the next day. How do you grapple with this workload, especially after all the running around in convoys and everything? How do you grapple with all that? I can tell you for one fact, it has, at that time, it was a bit difficult. Um, mm. You have, after, like you said, running around yeah. from one point to another, mm. you're a bit exhausted and you, you want to have a rest, but you have to do that. So what um, I usually do back then was to have along all of my gadgets, my my laptop as well. Okay. So whenever um, perhaps there's, there's a little break in between, mm where the president is um, making some lunch break or something with a um, group of people having some conversation and we are free as journalists. I go about writing my story and make okay. sure that I send that quickly to my newsroom. Or sometimes I do I do the audio. I do the audio and have some of my colleagues um, perhaps help if they are available to help with the cutting of the the, the audio and I do the writing of the script. Hmm. These almost yeah. 10 years you have been here, I'm sure you have seen a number of colleagues, some of them your seniors, others your own colleagues or even younger ones who have left the craft. Mm -hmm. 
Some were very promising, some were talented, some were highly trained. Attrition in journalism is very high. From where you sit, what do you think is accounting for this high level or high rate of attrition? So many are leaving from time to time. Uh, so I would say it's due to uh, the, the poor remuneration, welfare mm. of journalists. Yes, um, journalists are human as well as any other person that is working mm. in as much as journalists are there to, to um, inform the public, to influence decision making by uh, stakeholders. They too have needs. They need mm. to take care of their family. They need to um, take care of themselves for their upkeep in terms of being um, set for their repertorial duty. So the, the need for a better compensation is important. So if you have a journalist who go to work, they do all of the work, they wake up in the morning by 4 a.m., they are at the radio station by, by 5 a.m., by 6 a.m., to ensure that the news is cast, to ensure that they are at that beat as early as um, the newsmaker can get there. That journalist as well need a salary or compensation that will also help them to go about. But if they, they don't have all of those things and they too have to be worrying how to, to get set transportation, how to get their gadgets and all of that, it becomes so challenging. It becomes so difficult for them. As a result of that, you realize that a lot of people will come into the profession and they will leave. And sometimes when they go to school, they have the qualification, they get um, educated, they have the requisite uh, credentials. They don't uh, any longer feel of, you know, every time coming to a place where you come, you do the work, you do all of the work, you come sooner, you go home late, and at the end of the day, when the month ends, you don't have anything to account for. You have to pay bills. You have to do other things. There are some, they don't have families. Some have families and they have to do all of that as is related to um, taking care of themselves. So you realize that there are a lot of journalists who leave the profession. They try to find other means to survive. Even um, entering into the profession as well is a bit challenging. When you get into it, you have to prove to um, others, prove to um, perhaps your colleagues, prove to your bosses that, yes, I'm up to the tax and I can do this. And they will see means of sometimes putting you on some transportation to say, yes, um, you can have this transportation, which is not enough for that person. So at the end of the day, you realize that that person will be demotivated. Mm -hmm. So they will try they will try to find something different that they can do as a result of that i can say that's what leading to most of um journalists entering into different um profession or different areas where they can acquire a better living condition hmm. let me put you on the spot now does journalism pay does it pay no, <laughs> no. For where for where we are here in Liberia, so I don't know much about Ghana. I don't know it's much the same about story. Nigeria. Uh -huh. But in Liberia, it's no. Uh, till now, there are some journalists that will tell you they have their kids. They will tell you that I'm telling my child that when they come to me and I ask, I'm quoting someone now, or a friend will say, my child came to me and tell me that they want to be a journalist. I would tell them, you, don't dare tell me that again. So it's it's like that. So sometimes they kind of, what I'm going through now, my child, they want to do that. They cannot do that. They cannot do it. In as much as we are yet, we are watchdogs of society. We are there to, you know, um, speak out for the public, for the citizen, to ensure that their lives get better. It is important too that those who do those things are, you know, well paid. So to answer your question, no, in Liberia, it is it is very bad. There are people who even work for three months, six months. Sometimes their institution owe them, and at the end of the day, they don't even get um proper 
address by giving them their salary. Some of them will write, they will talk about it. And when they are frustrated, they just leave and find something else to do instead of being behind their employer throughout. If we are to go back into time, 12 years, are you still going to choose journalism? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. And for me, um, I think for where I, I am now, I'm actually passionate. I'm passionate about journalism because I feel that there are a lot of issues that are confronting our country. There are a lot of issues that are affecting our people that need to be exposed, that need to be talked about. And if we we don't have people who will be there to speak out and to ensure that um, our government, stakeholders, or whosoever policy, policy makers can act, we won't have a society that we want to see. So I feel that within that um, light, I'm best suited to where I am, and I'm passionate about that. Since I've been for the time now, decade, there have been other opportunities coming my way, you know, in terms of better salary, attractive salary, attractive um job opportunities. But I've said to them, no, um, let have let let have a check a little bit. This is not what I want to do. I want to see myself as a journalist to do more for my country, and I'm passionate about that. So. For the next 12 years, yes, I will be I will be a journalist and a journalist that will also help others to know the way in terms of doing their work, to appreciate the work they do as a journalist. Let's talk about social media. Yeah. When you started, I'm not sure social media was that big an influence on journalism as it is today. From mm -hmm. where you sit and based on your experience, how has social media changed the practice of journalism? Um, social media has added a lot mm. um, for the positive um, angle. It has ensured that um, journalists can be up to the tax yeah. in terms of being on time with news, mm. in terms of being um, timely, and being to the point because you have if you are a journalist and you are not on top of your game you mm. are not ensuring that you you get the right information before you make up your mind social media already has the information so this makes um journalists to be on their feet to be prompt with their their news gathering and to ensure that they can inform their people on the other end social media has come with a lot of misinformation and disinformation to the public. That what um imposes another challenge for the work that journalists because if um a citizen journalist just wake up and go on social media, you have mm. everyone posting about something, something that is not factual. And you as a journalist now in coming back to the public on your own outlet to say no, this is what it is and this is what has happened sometimes people don't even believe what you say because they have already gotten information from social media that is not totally true that has some um disinformation within but because they have gotten that from social media so they turn to consider that as a good um information that they they have gathered but you know with all the good uh uh, aspects of social media. Mm -hmm. Bloggers are making more money from social media than journalists are making. Where did mm -hmm. we go wrong? Is there something we are not doing right? You and I have the training that should make us masters of information dissemination and public education. What are we not doing right? Why are we not millionaires and billionaires? Since social media is just an extension of one more platform that we can use to educate and inform the public. Yeah, so with that, I think we um, need to see how best we can use that. There are others who are using the social media, but like you said, blockers are far, far ahead of us. 
Mm. And one of those issues as well has happens to be, I think um the blockers, they don't go for um they don't go for how do I call it? They don't go for balancing their information. Okay. They don't go for that. Blockers just sometimes break the news as it unfolds. Sometimes they don't get the side from both parties. Yeah. They run with certain information, but you have a journalist that will want to have both sides to be um, authentic in the information that they give out to the public. So sometimes it is lower or slower their pace of reporting on the social media. And, and also, I think there's this issue, this crisis about um the new media and mm -hmm. the traditional media um because it is important i had a training where yes we um saw a couple of institutions who are making use of social media and mm -hmm. showing that they broadcast frequently on social media and that is now happening with this um facebook live that we as journalists are using as well in terms of broadcasting all of our contents, having social media live, when we are in studio, when we are out in the field, our film, all of those things have a live um, streaming going on that people can follow. And I think we need to do more in terms of that. We need to have more training and mm -hmm. improve on how we do it different than what the blockers are doing that will bring a real sense of um, belonging that people we really actually want to to continuously watch our our page and how we go about to ensure that we can also um get money from that if we monetize our social media platform. But again, also in my country, Liberia, um, we have not gotten there yet in terms of mm -hmm. monetizing, you know, our platforms. Okay. So it kind of make a little bit difficult. But some people are trying to do that now. And we mm. hope that we can get there and make social media a very, very uh, good tool that we can generate income and mm. also inform the public. Yeah. Mm. In Ghana, we call it solid. That is solidarity. Is the short form for solidarity? Liberia okay. calls it uh, cattle or professional services. Okay. In Cameroon, they call it brown envelope or gombo, Nigeria calls it brown envelope. Uh, down in Malawi, they call it logistics. I am <laughs> sure by now you know what I am talking about. I One know, you already call me. Several surnames. What is your take on this practice, that envelope-bearing money, which is handed out to journalists, maybe after they go cover events, or they go interview that newsmaker or popular person? What is your take on it? I would say it is not a good practice. Mm. It is it is not good in a sense that um, as a journalist, you are going to do all, and especially um, a work that you need information to be balanced, yeah. to inform the public. Um, not the kind of information you go out for that is public, um, public relations related that for mm. publicity and that you have to promotional work. It's not promotional work. But as a journalist, you, you go out to get your information, to inform the public. So it is important that you do your work with independence. But then um, we can kind of see that happening in our society because of what we talked about previously, the issue mm. about low um, salary payment, the issue yeah. about some institution not paying the journalists as well. So you see our journalists will wake up in the morning. They have to go to work. They pay their way, transportation. They pay their own way. They go at the institution to go for the beat. You go in the field, you are paying your own way. The institution um, do not provide um, transportation. They do not provide vehicle for you to go and do the work. And sometimes some people, um, some journalists, they don't have the means of other source of income. So when they go at those areas, they see someone um tell you that, oh yeah, in Liberia we say kato. We got yes. a kato, they, they gave you the kato and think they give hand down that uh, envelope and say your share more than yourself. They will also take it because they feel that if I leave this um and go, how will I go home? How will I even go at the at the station 
or at my newsroom to do this story. I don't have transportation. I don't have the means. But my my take on it is that it's not good um for our profession because it honor mind your independence. It honor mind your integrity in terms of balancing the story. So on my thing, yes, I can give this person this money and they think that they influence the story that you would do. And if they have a side that is not favorable that you need to report on, they feel that they yes by handling by handling sorry that uh, envelope you will change your mind to put the story um in favor of them. So mm. I would say there's a need that media institution actually pay their workers and show that um the unions we have, the associations we have can mm. actually do can actually do well for the journalists in Liberia. There's, there was this proposal um, called the collective backing it to ensure that journalists are paid well at certain um, rate that is mm. better for them to now it, it is still lingering. It is still there. No, no one has actually put it out to yeah. talk about it to ensure that they can work on it. And another thing in Liberia as well that is also um, a challenge to financial gain by institutions having mm. to be the issue of publicity advertisement okay. mm. yes not many institutions yeah or businesses in liberia want to advertise people feel that when they got when they buy their products they bring in their products and mm. their goods and services they don't need to come at the radio station to carry on publicity as no someone can go to their shop can go to their store can yeah. go at the um the company and buy the products they are okay until perhaps we can have some regulations that can compel people to make some at least publicity on that that will also help us in Liberia. What are your golden memories? It's been almost 10 years. Any occurrences or anything that happened in the line of duty, which for you makes it's so worth it, so exciting, so beautiful. Anytime you look upon it, it brings joy to your heart. Any golden memories? Okay, so um, I think um, looking at how I do my work. Okay. And whenever um, sometimes I meet some people out there mm. and then they tell me, Denise, you are doing good. Keep it up. Mm. We follow you. You can do better. You can do this. You know, all of um somehow sometimes they compliments, sometimes they um they criticize him and all of that. That mm -hmm. help a lot. Yes, mm -hmm. for the work I do. And one of one of those um moments happens to be um my interview with the with the former president um uh, President Weir. Okay. It was a time. Yes, he went to um visit. He went to visit the um, IAA, that is the okay. internal division. Yes, okay. there was some incident there at that time. Uh, the head uh, has just passed out, and mm. he went there. There was yeah, they were having um, some um, time to there. Yes, he visited the place during the time the head passed out. So mm. others went along with him, and it was kind of difficult because President we are then at that time you you do not usually get him to to interview yeah. him because mm. there will be too much of um, protocol around mm. they don't want him to just talk and all of yeah. that they want for it to be guarded as mm. he speak to the public so that perhaps there won't be any issue with, with mistakes or any other thing yeah. so um when when he went upstairs to the place and all of his um associates the press secretary the mm. information minister and all of those people went along with him. And when he was descending the stairs where he was coming down, they were not um, with him. Wow. So they all left. <laughs> yes. They, they all left uh, upstairs. They left upstairs. And right in that time, I caught, up, I caught him right on the spot. So as soon as he came, I was just right in for him. And then I went on with my with my interview with him. So I was like questioning him, asking him the reason why he was there and what has happened and all of that. And it was, he was talking from one thing to another and he made mention 
It was the time he spoke, he mentioned about the issue about um, CCTV camera in, in um, various um, institutions okay. that Liberians should ensure that they have CC camera at institutions and mm. all of that. For that interview at that time, knowing that the way in which he he um, responded, mm-hmm. yes, he have said something and it went in the public, like he was saying different things, like all Liberians should have CC camera at their, their home. So people t- then saw it like that. So now people, um, the public have been using that um, um, clip on him. It, it also played during the election. People were, oh, the president said we should get our own CC camera. Well, we don't have money. How will we get CC? Yeah, how will we get CC- CCTV? How will we have CCTV at all places? So um, sometimes when I'm, in, when I'm in the taxi, when I'm in the gathering, you hear people talking about that. They will be saying, oh, he said this. And I will just laugh and say, ah. But I cannot go around and say, oh, I'm the one that did an interview of the president and all of that. So uh, that 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 is um, some of those, you know, kind of mm. interesting, yeah, moments in our profession. But there are a lot, there are a lot of them right. to talk about. Okay. Yeah. Let me take your, your thoughts on this media matter, political ownership of the media. All across Africa there, and even parts of the world, there are politicians or politically connected people who own and control big and highly influential media houses. Across the border from Ghana in Nigeria, the president, the certain president, Bola Ahmed Tinubu is the owner of the nation newspaper, one of the most powerful daily newspapers in Nigeria, and also TVC television. It's a whole media empire. Political ownership (laughs) of the media. I want your thoughts as a media practitioner. Is it a good development or we are sitting on a time bomb? We are sitting on a time bomb. Hmm. I say for sure, yes. I say this to say that um, having politicians in media institution Hmm. is a serious problem. Hmm. We are faced with that like about 90% of our, from our own stats, mm. like 90% of our institutions in Liberia are yeah. owned by politicians. Mm. Yes. It makes it difficult for advertisement mm. for you to have um dealing with other opponents, other people who are politicians who are rather or who are from the opposition party Take, yeah. for example, if you have a, a media institution and that media institution is owned by someone who is in government, mm. those who are opposition um, political parties, sometimes they they will refuse to come at your institution. Mm. You give them invite to appear on the radio or the television, they will decline because why they feel that they go there, they, they, there's already... Um, this mindset of that institution, the policy, the policy of the institution. So I'm an opponent. I cannot go at that institution. And also, it, it, it is also a challenge to the journalists themselves, because in times of political happenings, in times of pol- elections and things, sometimes the journalists themselves, they are independent. They are, yeah. they are, they are independent. Yeah, they are. Their integrity gets a uh, question because yeah. the owner, they, there's ownership will play. So the owner will sometimes want you to to speak out for them. Will mm. sometimes want the kind of content you put out to be in their favor, and some other um journalists will not have the the resilience or re- yeah to actually be that. To say no, I cannot go about doing that. That will um taint my 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 reputation as a yeah. as a journalist. And they will go on putting their career on the line, fronting for, for politicians, all because those politicians are owner of the media institution. I had this um in my case, I had um personal experience. Okay. During the election. Yes, during the elections, I was working with a media institution. 
mm. that was owned by a politician. Okay. Someone who someone who was affiliating with the then uh, administration. Okay. So yeah, it was kind of difficult. I get on the radio, you want to be critical, you want to talk about the issue, the real issue. They see you as um like you are opposing to them. And mm. you say, Oh, she's not in our interest, she's opposing to us, and she cannot be on the radio, you know, saying things against the government for which I'm part of. So mm. it makes it difficult for the work you do. It's kind of difficult. That also contributed to demotivation uh, of a lot of journalists, demotivating them mm. from leaving because they kind of wanting to be critical in terms of telling a balanced story, reporting a balance uh, um, happening. But they cannot do that because the ownership of the institution has some political um, alliance with some political person. So it makes it a, a difficult tax. So with po politicians owning media institution, I can tell you we are sitting on a time bomb and, and it is important that there's we can work around that to see how best that can be, you know, solved, that can be resolved, that can be actually handled. I had a, when I visited the U.S., that, mm. that was a question that oh, I asked as it relates to media institution. And what okay. they said that, no, in, in the U.S. here, we don't give license to politicians to open radio stations. Mm. So I was like, oh, that is good. But in Liberia, we do that. Even if a politician, and when it comes to the period of election, during the electionary period, you see that a lot of politicians will start to open media institution that they will use as a tool to run their campaign. So it is actually rampant in Liberia. Uh, perhaps in Ghana, it is not as yeah. much as in mm. Liberia. Yeah. yeah. In the line of duty, has there been a time somebody approached you uh, we have heard you are doing this story. Uh, take this and then forget about the story or rather change the facts of the story. I'm talking about bribery or attempted bribery in the line of duty. Have you had any such experience? Yes, I, I've had that. I have a couple of that. Um, and one of those uh, happens mm. to be there was this time... Um, there's this place, um, like a restaurant okay. that you have um, workers, you have the waiter, the waitress, and all of those who work at that restaurant. Um, they, they were having issues with the management. The management wasn't actually paying. They were owing them their salary, and it was delaying. I think they decided not to pay them for I don't know what reasons. So the workers went on the rampage, they, they started to protest and started to demand as well for, you know, management to pay them, all of that. Mm -hmm. So um, some of them to try to go to media, they went to media institutions, they engaged journalists and think, I heard about that. I decided to, you know, follow up on the story, to okay. do the story, to report on it. So I got a side of those workers who came, who I interviewed, and then I needed to have gone to the the in the the restaurant to speak mm. with the owners to hear yeah. from them why are they not paying the workers? So um I went there. I when I placed a call to the management, the manager said, "Okay, you can come this day." So I mm. decided to go. When I went, um they said, "Okay, we, we decided to bring." According to them, it was the the company lawyer to talk okay. with me. Yes, on the issue and talk. I said, "Okay." So when I went to him, he said, oh, we're trying to pay, the management is paying the staff, and because we had the issue with them and all of that, but we we have resolved the issue, we're going to pay them and all of that. I said, okay, that's fine. Saying you're going to pay, you, I got, I got their own side. So when I was about to leave, and then he, he went, he took an envelope, he brought, he said, just wait for me. He went in, brought the envelope, and then hand me the envelope. Mm. So um, actually from the conversation, the way we were talking, it was like yeah. he he never wanted me to 
go on with the story. Okay. To actually report that. Yes. So he came, he came, he brought the envelope. And then I told him, I said, no, thank you. Thank you for that. I don't need the envelope. I'm okay. So he was like, no, you can. I said, I'm okay. I came with a car. He said, no, you can take it. You can take it and use it. Take it and take the envelope. I said, no, it's okay. I'm okay. Then he said, you sure you okay? I said, yes, I'm fine. <laughs> so I left the envelope. <laughs> I left the envelope. And then I, I was leaving the restaurant. And what is interesting to know is that when I was leaving, I didn't know that some of the workers were in the corner watching our conversation and watching us. So when I told him, thank you, I left. When I came out of the place, I think three or I think three of them also ran behind me. And then they called my attention. They was like, Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You did not, you did not, um, you did not take the envelope. I said, why? They said, oh, what? We're in the corner. <laughs> We're in the corner watching you people. Thank you. Thank you. You did not, you did not take the envelope. I said, for oh, why? Say yes. So there are others who came, you know, and when they come, they give them the envelope and they oh. tell them not to, not to talk, not to. I was like, no, for I, that cannot be done like that. I don't do that. So they said, thank you. And then it was said that when I reported the story after a um, few days, I received call from some of the workers that, oh, yeah, so they have started making the payment. They have started making our payment. They pay some of our colleagues, and they say that they will get to the orders. So it has been like that, yes. I've experienced it. You know, journalism has a lot of landmines. One of them is what you've talked about, <laughs> bribery. The other one yeah. is threats in the line of duty. Sometimes when they bribe you and you prove too difficult, they find a way of putting the fear of God in you, if I may put it that way, threatening you uh, for you to know that, okay, uh, if I don't do this, maybe my life or that of my family will be at stake. In the line of duty, have you ever been threatened? Um. So no, I would say no, okay. in a sense. Yes, although I've, had um some colleagues who have received uh threatened remark and things like that mm. based on the work they do they have reported that but what what i experienced uh was like a tip off from my work okay. yes i was i was pursuing a story that was highly critical uh -huh, with that so along the time i was here and there you know fact checking mm fact finding information reaching out to people and then um i reached out to someone because that story was actually about some um murder and all of mm -hmm. that so the person reached out to me and called me and said denise you have to forget about um that story please just forget about that and not pursue it um it was someone who i i know like that so okay. The person knew me and they were kind of maybe within cycle with the where I was wanting to get information and thing and people who they has been involved. So they told me they say, forget about that, do not pursue that. That is not a, a good path to go. So I was like, oh why? Say so they brought up kind of, you know, talk in there with that. So mm -hmm. it, it actually shows that it was actually a critical point a story okay. that I was pursuing that was actually uh -huh, that was something that could threaten my mm -hmm. life and all of that so they were trying to give me tip off as to be very careful on how I do that but to have received um threat from someone like you know no you 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 should not do this I mean you do this will do that no I've not received that but some mm -hmm. of these that they have received such mm -hmm. This love affair between yourself and journalism, is it for life or there will be divorce at a point? Are you doing journalism for life? Till death do you part? <laughs> uh, I would say in some, because um sometimes you don't know what happened in the next few um years or so. Yes. For, for where I am, yes. For where I am, I, I would say yes. 
I will say yes. And even if um I'm not actively involved in um reporting like in the field, mm -hmm. I can do it from another angle, you know, in terms of a bigger picture and that. Mm -hmm. But I can say yes, it's for life, journalists for life. Doing that, what I love, I actually love that. Like I said in my my opening statement that from my childhood, it mm -hmm. wasn't my dream in terms of, and I was someone who actually never used to like news. Whenever um, <laughs> I'm sitting with my my parents in the living room and the news comes on, I'm like, ah, oh, what is this? Whole day they will be talking, just talking plenty. They're just talking plenty. I don't want it, too much talking. So they'll be like, well, why you don't want to listen to news? I said, no, I don't want. So I was like, something that for my childhood used to be like a really trouble. Mm. That's why I, uh, I've come to love, um, yes, in my in my adulthood. So it's something that I really have passion for. I'm actually passionate about that. Mm. And I do sometimes encourage most of uh, even my colleagues, the younger ones, those who are coming in the field um, of journalism, at time I would tell them it will get better. Because mm. um, when you come, you see it, it looks so difficult. You don't, you know, kind of find your way out. Sometimes you come in the newsroom, you just sit the whole day. You say, but what am I doing? You sit down the entire time. But I tell them that you have to be pushing. You have to be determined in doing what you do and what you love. And when you put in passion, like I always tell them, it's only passion that can make you to enjoy journalism the way you would do the work. Because... It's not about a job that you are going to see someone giving you car, someone giving you house, someone giving you money that is there for. It's the work that you put in that gives you um, the kind of, um, kind of recognition, the kind of work that you need, that you desire. So I kind of have this um, thing that myself do in terms of mentoring mm. the ones that are coming in. Okay. Yes, talking to some of them. Yeah, helping them with their work to help them to stay on. So sometimes somebody will tell me, yeah, Dennis, we listen to you, following we yeah, we, we we are taking it one step at a time. I will say, yes, that continue to take it one step at a time. Because if we have everyone, you go to school, you learn, you get your degree, you leave um the field of journalism. How will our journalism profession be in Liberia? You have only amateurs, you have people who are not schooled to that that will be doing journalism, that will make it to look good, that will make it to look professional. So we have to keep holding on. So I'm here, I'm here with the journalism. I'm around. I, I'm here for, for a very longer time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, if there is a proposal to license journalists, just as medical doctors or lawyers are licensed to practice, will you support it or you frown upon it? I will support that 100%. Mm. Yes. There has been um, the discussion here in Liberia with some other colleagues who, you know, have been talking about the licensing of um, journalists mm. because um, there, there are a lot of um, uh, infiltration of people who are not, quote unquote, actual journalist you know the the the, the journalism profession is almost like teaching profession mm. someone can get get a chalk and get a, I mean, a pen and one less school yeah or school can take you and say oh i'm a teacher you start teaching okay. and start. so most often you find people somebody will just have their camera and say oh i can take picture i'm a journalist mm. and it starts small small they become yes some people just so it's like that so if we have this issue about licensing journalists, it will be good. That will bring integrity. That will bring uh, professionalism to the um to our career as a journalist. That will also gain um will bring about public trust, public mm -hmm. confidence, and respect for the profession. Because um if we just have have anybody just coming in without a requisite training. As long as they can take microphone, they can take recorder and carry it and put it to somebody and say, talk, let me hear you. You know, like that way that we say in Liberia, that will make the field um, polluted, it will pollute the field. A lot of 
people would just come infiltrate, say I'm a I'm a journalist and just go and buy without knowing the actually ABC about journal about of journalism and just make the profession to be not what people want it to be. This has also contributed as well to a lot of people leaving because you have people don't want to follow the, the requisite procedure. They just want mm -hmm. to take a microphone, take recorder, and just pass around. There's some like kato, the kato issue. They say, oh, I'll go this place, I'll get kato. I'll go this place, I'll get the envelope. So let me be your journalist. So I think with that, that can help. That will help as well. Yeah. Uh, some colleagues on this platform have expressed fears about licensing of journalists of journalists. They say the politicians we deal with are very troublesome and smart characters. And some of them can hide behind the licensing bodies to take vengeance on journalists whom they consider as troublesome, especially the investigative and no-nonsense journalists. Because obviously mm -hmm. once it's a license, it will be subject to renewal. Some of these critical journalists may have their renewals and licensing issues delayed with all sorts of flimsy excuses. Of course, there will be a body of journalists responsible, but <laughs> politicians may find a way of hiding behind them to settle scores with some of these journalists who are making life uncomfortable for them by exposing them. You don't think there is a downside to licensing journalists? Yes, um, they are right. They have their point. Mm. Um, their points are well noted in things in terms of what you're saying. But also, what I think is that um, whenever there is a new kind of um, policy um, coming up or some some um, process being put into place, there mm. will always be some um, guidelines. There will always be some policy. There will always be some measures mm. to ensure that... Um, mm. All of what you have mentioned can be considered, can be um, taken care of. So I think it's the way in which that will be done. It's not just about saying, yes, journalists go and be licensed, that when your license expires, you have to go and renew it. There should be um, plans and strategy put into place on how to go about that. There should be um, an institution um that will be in charge okay. to regularize how journalists get um their license whether yeah. um some politician want to get to the journalist uh, even in Liberia currently we have the PUL mm. the PUL is our union body yes that speaks for journalists uh, stands okay. for journalists whenever there's um some you know, issues with journalists or someone tried to infringe on their rights and things like that. So I think the PUL will still be functional. You, you just have to, what we need is to strengthen the institutions mm. that we have in terms of advocating for the well-being of journalists, for the welfare of journalists, that when a, that a politician cannot just come up and say, because this person is kind of critical, so I want to clamp down on their their work they do. So I will have to, you know, um, ensure that they don't get licensed. So I think it's just about strengthening our institutions and ensuring that 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 could work or that can work because it is important that we do that. Doing that will help because before a journalist um get the lesson, you have to prove uh why you should you should have it. You have to show whether you are qualified. There will be criteria set. You have to meet those criteria before you can be considered as a journalist. So I think if we do that, that will help. The lawyers mm -hmm. are doing that. Others are doing that. So if we try to do that, I think that will help in as much as there will always be um, politicians who will want to get as some journalists any time, any given time. Without the issue of license, they mm -hmm. are still making, they are still doing that. So having a license is about having this um some level of confidence some level of respect some level of 
um, consideration from the public for the work we do and how we carry ourselves as a journalist. If any young person walks up to you and says, I want to be a journalist in the future, is that person getting your blessing? And what is that advice you will give the person? Obviously, yes, I will do that. And there are several who also reach out to me, okay. or they do, mm -hmm. usually. Um, and I also encourage them to be steadfast, um, to be to be determined, to be um, perseverance in the work they do, and be persistent with the work they do, putting um, integrity first, putting passion in the work they do, and be intentional about journalism. It's not about the theme. It's not about um, all that comes with it, the accolade and all of that. But it's about making sure that you do the right thing. So I always encourage them to be persistent, to be determined, to be courageous, and be truthful in what they do. Be accountable for the work they do. That um, when they are, they are somewhere, they can beat their chest and say, "Yes, this is what I did as a journalist. This is my work." That's why who is around. Always be true to the work you do by by making sure that. You consider your ABC of journalism. Um, that's why I always tell them, passion, be passionate driven, and also be determined and be persistent to be a journalist. My final question. Yeah. Give me two names of two international figures if that if you have an opportunity, you want to interview them, one male, one female. <laughs> you didn't see it coming, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I when I have the opportunity, I really I I think I would say anybody who wants to um have an interview of a journalist they have with a president and having um mm. the president, yes. Well, I, I don't think that will happen, but the president of the United States, I'm having an interview with him. That would be a dream come true, though. <laughs> wow. Is it any yeah. president of the United States or Joe Biden currently? Um, that, that would be perhaps based in the era we are. We are Very in. well. Very well. Yeah. Okay. So, female... Female, I think I have a female in mind that um that 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 my mind right now is actually you know um picturing currently, yes. But um I I I can of uh, one of those internationally that I really admire um though is that a quote unquote journalism uh, as well is Oprah Winfrey. Okay. Oprah. Okay. Yes. Okay. I actually admire her, the work she do. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for this conversation. It's been exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yes. you for this. I know I put a lot Thank of pressure you. on you. It's not easy. You know, uh, this is our work. Uh, we yes. all understand that sometimes you have to pursue it aggressively till you get the news, you know. So yes. I'm truly grateful for your time and your thoughts on Pairs Down. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on Pairs Down. It's always a pleasure um, that I will be back on this um, platform. It was actually interesting and it was wonderful being in conversation with you. And I hope to join you anytime soon. Thank you. Very well. Thanks for joining us. This has been Pairs Down. Today we travel to Liberia, one of the English-speaking countries in West Africa. And we touch base with a multimedia journalist based in Liberia. Denise Nipson was my guest on Pairs Down. We've spoken to her, we've talked her journalism journey, and also we've picked her thoughts on a few media mountains. We are back again with another colleague, and still we'll be talking journalism journey. That will be all for now. Bye for now.